welcome back to Anatomy of Algebra. I'm calling this episode Quadratic Dreams. This time, the tidbit of algebra I'd like to pry open is another equation for us to solve. It's a quadratic equation. If you're not too far away from your last algebra class, you'll also remember, in addition to equations that look like this, something called the quadratic formula. Some of you probably even know this in song form. If you try to solve a quadratic equation, I promise you it's possible without any frustration. If to recap from last episode, there's already some things that we can recognize about this equation up here. For instance, x is a symbol representing an unknown quantity. Either explicitly or implicitly, we've been asked to solve this equation, and uh, that entertains a taking on this game of solving for x and moving x to one side of the equation. And there's certain rules that we're allowed to use when doing so. The letters a, b, and c that I've written here are called constants. And unlike x, they represent numbers that we do know. This innovation came rather late in the history of algebraic notation, and it was supposedly a big deal. So what I'd like to do in this episode is to figure out where the quadratic formula comes from, why it's true, and to look at some of the easy, powerful, and yet unfamiliar ways that we can manipulate equations to solve for an unknown. First question though, does the quadratic formula actually solve this problem? Just about, as we'll see. The student who gets this question on their test needs to connect the generic constants a, b, and c to the coefficients that are actually given in the problem. In this case, let's see. We can tell that a should be 3, that b should be negative 5, and that negative is the thing that always messes people up, and that c equals 1. And what allows us to do this is that this quadratic formula also goes along with the standard form of the quadratic equation. ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So a lot of times in a class, you know, for like a test or something, you'll be given a quadratic equation and you're going to have to get it into this form in order to solve it. And the idea is that any equation that's similar enough might look kind of like this one. But let's think about another, let's see if I can mess it up real good. Let's say I've got 3x plus 7x squared equals 4x squared plus 8x minus 1. Now it might take a minute to see that this is the same equation, or rather it's an equivalent one, to the one we started out with today. A homework problem for you all is take our equation up here and dress it up in a terrible, awful way using algebra, and then show us how to unwind it to the original. All right, moving on, let's talk about plugging in and actually solving this equation. So the way quadra solving quadratics is dealt with in school is by having students memorize this formula over here and then to use it to solve quadratics that they're given. Mechanically, what you end up doing is known in the business as plug and chug. First, you assign the existing coefficients, a, b, and c, their values. Then you've got some arithmetic to get through. In this case, let's give it a try. So we're gonna use these in here to try and solve that. And I'll get rid of the standard equation for a moment. So plugging in, I get x equals minus b. And if you think a minus is tough, it's tough to have a minus of a minus minus 5 plus or minus the square root of minus 5 squared minus 4 times a is 3 times 1. Well, at least something there is easy. All over 2 times 3. Okay, so we've got some arithmetic to get through there, right? We're going to have to know that minus minus 5 is equal to 5. Here's where we get into the history a little bit. I mentioned last time that um, negative numbers didn't come along until much further down the road of history than you might imagine. And then the other thing about it is, when we do get negative numbers, why should they come out the way that they do? I mean, why is a negative times a negative a positive? You ever thought about that? Well, we'll get to it later. We'll put a pin in it for now. Another homework problem for you is to try to come up with a real life situation anywhere you want, where you end up multiplying a negative by a negative. See if you can find one of those. Anyway, that's the only hard part of the arithmetic here. Let's see what else we get. That's equal to five plus or minus the square root of 25. That's five squared minus 12 all over six. Okay, and 25 minus 12 is 13. So this is five plus or minus the square root of 13 all over six. 
And kind of like the problem we had last time, sort of maybe depends on who your teacher is, what kind of answer you're allowed to hand in at this point. Maybe you get out your calculator um, and try and make sense of this in terms of decimals, or maybe you just leave it like that and turn it in. One thing that we might want to think about is, well, I guess we got kind of lucky that 25 is bigger than tall, otherwise we would have ended up with a negative number under there, and then things get a whole lot worse, right? But on the other hand, let's think about that for a second. What is the square root of 13? I mean, if you write down some decimal approximation that you get from your calculator, or that you plug into Google, is that the answer? Is that something else? It's maybe a little bit hard to say. So let's break this down into a couple explicit questions. You may have heard the phrase irrational number for something like the square root of 13. So what is an irrational number? Where did this word and concept come from? How do we know that the square root of 13 is an irrational number? Third question, what does a number being rational have to do with its decimal expansion? Four, if we can't write out a totally accurate decimal for irrational numbers, do they really exist? What processes are allowed to call numbers into existence and who gets to say? And finally, how does one actually go about writing out an approximate decimal for the square root of 13? These are important questions, but again, I'm gonna punt. In the case that your teacher is not a mathematician and just asks you to use your calculator to write out a few decimals, as long as you use a, an approximate sign instead of an equal sign, you can be done with the problem without facing deep existential crises about numbers. All you do is plug it into your calculator and write out some blah, blah, blah of decimals. Already, when we do this though, we're in a bit of a different world when it comes to solving. Last time we could do all of the arithmetic in our heads, and now we're having to kick out to a digital tool. Also, last time when we were solving 3x minus 7 equals 15, and we got an answer that was 22 over 3 or 7 and a third, it would be simple to check our work. One way to describe what it means to have solved the equation is that if we plug our answer in for x in the original equation, once we do all the arithmetic, the resulting equation should be true. We're asking what value of x actually makes this equation true. Plugging in x equals 22 thirds into our original equation, 3x minus 7 equals 15, works out pretty simply. One question is, could you check your work and actually plug in this value of x into that equation? Do all the algebra, like don't, don't get out a calculator, this is homework, plug in this value for x, do all the foiling and whatnot, and make sure that you actually get zero after you do all that arithmetic. If we do get out our calculator and find some decimal that this is close to, what does it mean to actually plug it in? If I write out a certain number of digits and I square it and then multiply it by three and then take away five times that same thing, since I know that that answer isn't going to be wholly accurate, I'm never going to exactly get zero from doing this. What happens if I do try and do that with a calculator? Let's see what we get. That's funny. I did get exactly zero. That can't be right. Um, well, maybe instead of using a calculator, you better check this by hand. So there's another homework problem. Use hand arithmetic to actually find the decimal approximation for this number, and then plug it in, whatever decimal approximation you get, into this, and, and do that all by hand so that you can see how far off you should really get. The result I got there from Google seems like it's, it's one of these recurring evil dreams that mathematicians have. Their awful dreams are when you plug in a decimal approximation and get exactly zero. One way that we could go from here is instead of plugging in the full decimal approximation you get, and in the case of Google, I get, I think about 12 digits. And so instead of getting those 12 digits, I'm going to put, plug in one digit less, again, into this equation that was giving me zero and see what it gives me. It gives me this business with E, 
okay, so I've got to learn how to read that number. Uh, it turns out that, that that's using scientific notation and expressing the number in terms of powers of 10. And it's giving me what turns out to be a pretty small number, at least in most cases, but it's not giving me zero. So what's happening between the, the first decimal digit I plug in and the second decimal digit I plug in is that the difference between the first value and zero itself is smaller than whatever number system is in the calculator can actually measure. But then the second time, because I've gone off by another power of 10 in accuracy, the calculator has enough resolution to actually show me the difference between that number and zero. So for me, this brings up a lot more questions that again, we're gonna to have to put off for another day, but are we worth at least bringing up because we stumbled across them? So how do computers and calculators actually count and do arithmetic? Do we like actually out in the world get into trouble with rounding errors like this? Are there like planes that are crashing or, or satellites that are flying off into space in the wrong direction or cities that are flooding because of this? Are these rounding errors ever a big deal or is it just stuff that we can brush under the rug and not worry about it? A final question is, would there be a better way to do it? Could you invent a way for computers and calculators to do these kinds of problems, to use numbers that didn't just end up arbitrarily chopping them off at some point? So again, we'll leave those questions for, for later. But for now, we have at least seen that starting with the quadratic equation and the quadratic formula that we've been asked to memorize, we can sort of remember how to plug into that quadratic formula. Negative B. Plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And get an answer, and at least if we're not thinking too hard about it, can be pretty satisfied that that is a solution to the equation. In our next section, I want to talk about where this thing comes from to begin with and why it should give us the right answer. Why does the quadratic formula actually do anything for us? Why does it solve the quadratic equation? So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.